evening about, um, yeah, especially this Sangha, but this group, we don't often take a lot of time to think about the progress that we've made in just showing up and being together. And maybe it's not every week, maybe it's not even every month, but that kind of steady and ongoing progress and dedication, it really makes a huge difference. I was thinking about all of the news cycles that we've weathered together here. And I actually like this afternoon, I was like, oh, I haven't looked at the news today. I should probably look in case there's something that we will have to turn adversity into the path in our, in our session tonight. And so deepening that connection through being a volunteer, being on the board, it's, yeah, it's, uh, we'll cover it in the slogan tonight, but it's, it's really useful to prioritize that which supports our dharma, even if it's not just tush on kush, as we covered last week, so unbelievably important. So, yeah, and uh, if you just joined, excuse me, I'm having some allergies today. Um, I don't think I'm going to sneeze during meditation, but I've heard that your own sneeze can give you a glimpse of Rigpa. So a glimpse of like primordial pristine awareness. So don't miss out on it. Maybe someone else's sneeze can also give you a glimpse of that. Um, Cause I think the idea is for a moment when you sneeze you forget who you are, what you're doing <laughs> and what matters. You're like entirely in sneeze realm. And then afterwards there's like this break before you realize what's next. So. Um, excuse me if I sneeze, but I, I will do so for the benefit of all beings, hopefully. So I'm Eve Ekman, so happy to be with you all this evening in the Dharma Collective as we continue and further our path with the Lojong slogans. I mentioned earlier, I think it's this is one of my very favorite new slogans. It's not one I have really found a love affair with before, but it is so thorough. It is a really dense and rich set of slogans. Um, and I think, or a set of pith sayings in this slogan, I think we'll enjoy together. And we'll start off with a practice. Uh, last week, we did a, a quite a long practice and it was um, really enjoyable, but this week we will do a more regular practice time, 20 to 30 minutes together. Um, in terms of setting up for your practice, really feel free to have absolutely any position that supports you. Um, I got to uh, have a visit with Lopan Chandra earlier this week, and we were talking about the body at ease. And when the body is at ease, it's as though the mind just knows how to unwind easier. And of course, we like the posture that supports this sense of uprightness and we can feel maybe some clarity through our central channel, <clears throat> but also having a sense of ease. It's just so important. And so if for your body, maybe for this time of day, that means reclining, that means leaning backwards, please, please do what supports your body. And in terms of the screen time that many of us have been having maybe a bit too much of, you can feel free to kind of turn the dimmer down so you don't have to see, but you can be there or turn to the side. All right. We will go ahead here. In this practice, uh, some of you may use Insight Timer. One of my favorite features on the Insight Timer, this really simple app, is that you can set a number of bells so that the practice can a bit be, be a bit more free flowing. So when you set the bell, it really, without words, without concepts, without getting too involved, it reminds you to come back. So in this practice, we will do just a bit of settling in with the preliminaries. And then we will just allow ourselves as much as possible to explore spacious awareness. So you'll hear these bells and the bells will be a reminder 
if we've gotten kind of caught and distracted, just to come back. So start off with a little instruction and then we will let the, we will let the bells guide us in a more significant way. <clears throat> It's not too late to take your first intentional breath of the day. Feeling the breath expand your body from the inside. Soften <clears throat> and relax through the forehead and between the brow. Soften and relax through the eyelids and the cheekbones. Through the lips and the jaw. No matter what else was going on before you arrived here, there's an opportunity to unwind and release and settle in. Continue settling in the body <clears throat> and feeling sensations throughout the body. Allow your experience of sensations to be just sensations. As much as possible without trying to understand them or fix them. Just settling into the body as it is. And then settling the speech or the inner dialogue and narration by focusing on the breath. As you inhale, notice and invite qualities of vividness, clarity. And as you exhale, connect to relaxation and ease. It can be helpful to, as you inhale silently to yourself, draw in clarity. And as you exhale silently to yourself, relaxation, ease.
feel or imagine a quality of the settled body as a body of stillness. And the settled speech is a quality of silence. And as we settle the mind, we explore the quality of openness. We can experience these qualities, stillness, silence, and openness, even if there's a lot going on. Maybe there's sounds in our environment. Maybe there's surface level thoughts and agitations. No problem. We can keep connecting at a deeper and deeper level to these qualities that are always already present. And we'll shift now that we've made our body and mind serviceable to take a couple moments here and reflect on the preliminary practices, these essential practices of remembering. Each of these phrases is simply meant to land in the mind, the body and the heart and stir. Maybe the experience is unpleasant or affirming. We just give ourselves a moment here to familiarize with these phrases and these preliminaries that point out to us the very essence of our practice. The first of these preliminaries, maintain an awareness of the preciousness of human life. like a pebble thrown in a pond that is still rippling outwards. Just notice and feel whatever arises when hearing these preliminary teachings. Be aware of the reality that life ends. Death and impermanence comes for everyone. Recall that whatever you do, 
whether virtuous or not, has a result. What goes around comes around. Contemplate that as long as you are too focused on self-importance and too caught up in thinking how you are good or bad, you will suffer. Obsessing about getting what you want and avoiding what you don't want does not result in happiness. We shift from these preliminary practices to the practice of settling our mind in its natural state. It can be helpful to settle our mind by briefly exploring our other sense portals to really highlight and identify the sense portal of perception, mental events and experiences. So taking a moment to notice what can be noticed through touch. Maybe you're rubbing your thumb over your fingertips, wiggling the toes, bringing alive that sensation of touch. Feel or imagine this was the only sense portal you had access to. Our entire world lived through felt sensation, touch. As you bring your full attention and awareness now to living through the sense portal of smell and taste. This could be quite subtle, lingering flavors from tea or dinner, the smell of the room we are in, maybe of our own shampoo.
And gently bringing our chin towards our chest so that our gaze would be downward. Blinking the eyes open for just a moment. Take in what can be taken in. Simply through this sense portal of sight. Colors and shapes, light, movement. Gently blinking the eyes shut and returning the head to rest evenly on top of the neck. Bring your full attention and awareness now to sound. What can be noticed through the sense portal of hearing. Hearing the sound of your own breath, hearing the sound of my voice, other sounds farther away. now shifting to the sense portal of mind perception. Noticing and receiving thoughts and memories and images, just like the sounds that arise and pass away. giving ourselves a step back away from the flow of thoughts, as though simply watching a river. Safely on the bank of the river, without getting pulled in and dragged down, we rest in the spaciousness of open awareness and observe and notice as thoughts go by.
Continue resting in awareness, observing the thoughts. When you hear the bell, it's a reminder to come back if you've been distracted. Take a moment to pause and notice that which is recognizing distraction. Then relax and release whatever has captured your attention and come back to observing the flow of the river. Sometimes the metaphor for this practice is used describing allowing yourself to be like the grandparent watching the children play. Your thoughts are like the children. You can watch them play without needing to interfere. Just delighting in the very activity, the coming and the going but not getting involved, not intervening. For just a bit longer, practicing, observing the thoughts and coming back without any sense of regret each time we get distracted.
if the mind feels dull or tired. This practice can also be done with eyes just hooded, letting a little light in. If it's distracting, just keep the eyes closed. Regathering our attention and awareness throughout the body. Noticing sensations throughout the body, just as we did at the beginning of practice, maybe now somehow different. Follow the natural rhythm of the breath. And feel the body being breathed.
gently bringing our practice to a close. Thank you for your practice. Thanks for practicing together. Any questions, comments, or reflections on practice? You can put those in the chat or raise your hand. Settling the mind in its natural state, SMNS as our acronym, <laughs> not that catchy, but um, it's like the whole, that's the whole thing, that practice, such an important one. Um, and it can be really tricky. It's actually simple, but not that easy. So um, yeah, I would love to hear any wonderings or questions about it that folks that folks are holding or anything they want to reflect on or share that they noticed. Glad to hear it's your favorite, Vicky. Me, it's, it's one of my favorites too. Yes. Sometimes when I've done that with you before, after we close all of our senses, then we like envision a lemon or like a <laughs> tree or that kind of thing. And I was just wondering about um, the difference between adding that and not adding that. Yeah, there's, that's a great question. So we can, yeah, like imagine or like place an object in our mind so that we can then in some ways, follow it and follow it as it dissipates. So we could imagine a tree. Sometimes people imagine the taste of a lemon. You can actually often salivate which, with that. And it's essentially showing us, because sometimes we're trying to look at our mind and we're like, where am I looking? Where, where is looking at the mind? I know where, I mean, smelling comes through the nose and hearing comes through, the, like, where does the mind? Um, so yeah, so I think that's a, that's a nice technique to kind of place something like an image or um, kind of an imagined experience, not so that you focus on that, on the tree or the lemon, but so you know kind of where to look, like that flash bulb and then what remains. Thanks for that question. Um, Ah, the bells were startling. Sorry about that, Claudia. They can be. Um, I think also Zoom doesn't do sound very well. Um, so it can be, it just depends on, on the timber. Um, and Noam appreciated the grandparent watching the kids. Yeah, I love that one. It's such a beautiful classic one. I'm listening to Minger Rinpoche's book called In Love with the World. Uh, some of you may be familiar with him. He's a wonderful teacher. And he did a three-year retreat as a wandering yogi, meaning he gave up all his worldly possessions. It was very kind of a privileged position as this teacher recognized early in his life coming from a very esteemed family. So he'd never purchased even a cup of tea on his own and did three years of wandering retreat. And uh, it's, it's a lovely book. And he was talking about that metaphor as he is entering the world for the first time in a train station, trying to not totally freak out because he's overwhelmed. And he's like, I can be like a grandparent 
watching my thoughts as though they were kids. Um, very sweet. Yeah, and I and I do think with you know settling body speech and mind in its natural state, you probably notice that Chandra and I often do that. It's a it's a very very kind of classic and simple way to help us get into our body, our mind, um, as we're coming from and transitioning from the rest of our day, which for many of us isn't a day full of meditation, but full of many other things. And so that can be a really nice progression. And with the breath, just a simple label, you could even say in and out can really help us focus. So I will move us on to the slogan, which I was hyping up. <laughs> it's very simple, actually. Um, the actual slogan itself is, don't misinterpret. So that's not quite exciting, but let me read it and then we'll go through it. There are six things that you may twist or misinterpret in your practice. Patience, yearning, excitement, compassion, priorities, and joy. So there are six things you may twist or misinterpret in your practice. Ooh, that's our smoke alarm, but it just seems to do that. I don't think there's actually anything going wrong. <laughs> um, six things that you may twist or misinterpret in your practice. Patience, yearning, excitement, compassion, priorities, and joy. And so what this, what this simple slogan points out is there are essential qualities for waking up on our spiritual path that we can even have a good understanding of. Like maybe we even know that list by heart. But we can, by just the unbelievable aspect of our, our mind and our delusion, we can actually like twist these to work against our awakening. So what's pointed out here are simple ways. So the first one is a misinterpretation of patience. Um, I've often said here, and, and I still hold it to be true, that I think patience is probably the most desirable quality that we can develop in a spiritual context, but that works throughout our life. And I also think if I offered a half day training on patience that no one would show up, it's not valued, right? And yet it is so important. Think about the majority of things that you regret. If you had a little bit of patience, many of them would just kind of dissipate. Our reactivity, our inability to regulate our emotional experience, all of this could really use patience. And when we think of patience, there's a couple different ways to interpret it, especially when we think about it in, in the context of the paramitas. But in the case here, this is really talking about um, being patient, being able to be patient with just about everything in life, except our practice of the Dharma. So we can find ourselves able to be patient for the difficulty of our mundane affairs, but not for the mind essence, not, not for cultivating our true practice. So maybe we're patient with, you know, our internet going out and not being able to fully stream the movie. So then we go and we like sit in our neighbor's backyard and we try to, you know, log back in or we're patient with always trying to find that perfect thing that will make our house even more comfy. Like, oh yeah, this is a nice bed frame, but if I had that other bed frame, but I'm just going to work hard till I find the right one. So we have this kind of patience applied in the totally the wrong place. So our kind of misinterpretation, another way um, that it's described in this slogan, kind of don't twist it or don't turn it the wrong way. So can we be patient with literally everything? And again, an amazing quality but we aren't patient in our practice of the Dharma. And I think many of us fall prey to this. So what does it mean to not be patient in our practice? It means that we have expectations of it moving faster, 
It means we think we should be farther along or doing better. So curious from folks, we have six of these. Does this resonate for anyone? Yeah, like having a challenge, feeling patient. Yeah. Anyone want to share what comes up as they hear this slogan? It's, it's really, especially um, these, I think it's really worthwhile to kind of apply these and really think about how they relate to us. Um, yes, Laura, then Tanya, yeah. I feel like a place where patience is sort of hard, like I can say, okay, I'm going to be patient, but then my mind will continue to drift to the thing. And so, you know, and practice can help with that, but it's like, then you end up kind of not being present because you're like, even though you're, it's cool, I'm cool, I'm going to be cool, I can wait, and your mind's just like, you know, that's right. the hard stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're describing beautifully rumination, right? Which I didn't know until a couple of weeks ago is actually a term that is derived from how cows digest. Um, yep. Just chewing and chewing and chewing. Um, so I would say there's probably a difference between like so-called true patience and then like suppressed rumination. And I think it's tough because how do we force patience? You know, if we aren't feeling patient, um, honestly, the preliminary practices help us. If you feel impatient, remember that you're going to die and that life is precious. And that, right, it's like we kind of, we take that bigger view, right? That can sometimes just like help get us out of what's hooking us. just an idea. Many yogis kind of every morning, the practice is to wake up and before anything else, before you put your feet on the floor, I am going to die just as a way to help in some ways with patience, but just perspective in general. So it sounds a bit jarring and dark, but it can be quite liberating. Uh, agreed. Yeah. You might as well make the most if you've got one minute to live, you know, right. very in the moment. So yeah, let us know how that goes. I'll be curious. See if, see if you can apply it on your next rumination. I will try. <laughs> Thank you. Tanya. Hey there. So for me, patience, I'm, I'm a very impatient person. And when it comes to my practice, what ends up happening is then my critic comes up, you know, um, and kind of like does some self-flagellation kind of thing, um, you know. So that's that's what that's what comes up for me in terms of that. And I realize I have to be compassionate and just you know, just take a chill pill, you know. <laughs> yeah. Just... Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I I completely resonate. And um, generally, I do my practice in the morning, um, and some mornings. I find my mind more cooperative than others. And it's really hard to be patient and not judge. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny because it brings up a different quality that is talked about the quality of discipline and the discipline of non-harming. Like how non-harming can we be? And we have to start with ourselves and with our own practice. And, um, you know, I, I, that's why, even though the slogan is kind of in some ways, it's kind of funny um, pointing out the ways we get it wrong. Um, you think you're patient because you sit down every day on your cushion. But are you really patient if you think that you should be doing better? And so this idea of really dedicating ourselves to the kind of patience that um, helps us. And, and in this practice, I mean, sorry, in this part of the slogan, especially it's don't don't worry about like how good your cushion is. Uh, don't get patient with the things that don't, don't matter, you know, really get patient with your own practice. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So the second one is how can we misinterpret yearning? 
So to have our yearning instead of for waking up, <laughs> our yearning is for wealth. Um, or we can have a kind of uh, a yearning um, for just meaningless worldly diversions, but not for the Dharma. And I'm going to maybe update this one a little bit to that topic of spiritual materialism. We have a yearning for waking up, but we apply that yearning by just kind of shopping around in different spiritual practices. So we really want to wake, you know, we really want to wake up, but we end up kind of using that desire to make it, oh, I need another mala bead. Oh, I just want one more workshop on whatever um, specific practice. And it's so great to learn. We have so many teachers and teachings available to us. But I think when I read this one, I was really thinking about that way that our, our yearning can be kind of subverted by more materialist approaches, you know, wanting things around our practice too. So yeah, yes, Tanya, I see your hand. How do you kind of like honestly look at yourself to determine if you're doing this sort of spiritual materialism or if you're just like really excited and interested to learn about a lot of different things? I mean, where does it, I imagine attention's part of it and like dropping in and trying to see what the, you know, feeling is about it. Like if it's like about acquisition versus just like being excited and want to learn. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you're, you're already onto it. I think there's a couple other pieces, um, you know, Chogyam Trimpa in his book, he does talk a lot about authentic devotion too, right? That it's a tough one because when you have these teachers who have really betrayed the devotion of their students, you're like, oh God, you're telling me about devotion, <sighs> but devotion as in like a reverence and a humility to the practice, which as you describe, is less about like an acquisition and more like a, a receiving. So that's, it's a stance as well as an intention. And I think, you know, it requires us to be kind of, um, you know, sober and honest with ourselves. Am I deepening or am I widening? So with our, with our practices, we really wanna have a sense of familiarity. Like we, you know, the practices aren't like just a pill that we could take at any time because we read the label. We actually need to like develop a relationship with our practices for them to work in harmony. And so if we learn a practice and we take notes on it for all weekend, but then the next weekend we're doing another practice, we kind of forget those notes and we don't even remember. It's confusing. I mean, I've definitely done that myself and it's and it I I love learning but I think it does take that um yeah that sober look is this really deepening so the very simple goal of our practice is to wake up to our delusions so we can really kind of use even our spiritual materialism as a way to wake up to our delusions so it can be joyful effort it doesn't have to be like oh man I no, I signed up for this somatic experiencing workshop, but I did the empowerment of, you know, POA last week. So maybe I shouldn't do more. Like, forget of the shoulds. Just really, do we have the space and time to practice? Are we just like fitting it in? Or can we really use these practices and apply them? It's, um, it's tough. I, I definitely see myself as someone who likes to bring things in? I, I, I like knowledge. I like, uh, you know, plants. I'm, I'm a many time a week grocery shopper, you know, like, oh, it's, it's uh. and so it's watching our habits too. What's hard? What's really hard for me, sitting down with what's already there and making it work. <laughs> I think that's hard for a lot of us. Most of us, you know, I think what really supports us is being in community with our practice and kind of showing up over and over and over and really deepening with that community, with that practice. It's one of the things I see missing more than anything else in our contemporary um, kind of 
landscape of meditation is that because we are often moving teacher to teacher to teacher, we don't have a community. Uh, and that can really prevent us from that relational part of moving ahead, kind of listening and speaking and hearing ourselves talk and hearing others talk and having that sense of connection. Totally self-promoting here, come to this community. Just kidding, but it is great to have you. And I do think showing up um, and making a habit of it is, is just, it's very helpful. Has anyone here experienced that real desire, that real yearning for waking up? You can't force it, but what it requires is a belief that you can. And I am gonna tell you, you absolutely can. It's really not, I think, as complicated as, as sometimes it seems. I totally get glimpses of it, of just the freedom from all these neurotic, anxious, worrisome, irritated mind states. Still me, still doing the things I do, but just free from that at a greater level. And to develop a yearning for it means we believe it can happen. I really encourage that. I had such a moving experience once, uh, a dear friend and Dharma practitioner, I'd say someone who was a, a Dharma door to me, who opened up a lot for me. We were on a retreat together and um, she had been talking with the teacher and she came back. We had these little, little huts right next to each other. She came back and I noticed she was crying. And I, you know, we're on retreat, but I was like, oh, I should, I should probably you know, we're friends, let's see if she's okay. And I went in and she's just crying, crying, crying. I was like, what did he say? And she said, I want to wake up so bad. I just, I know what it would feel like. And I feel he can show me. And it like brings tears to my eyes. Like her yearning was just so beautiful her desire for, for waking up and her ability to see it there. I, at that time, had no idea what she was talking about. I was like, oh, okay, you must be uh, having a unique retreat experience. But um, yeah, I've thought about that many times. Just so beautiful, that yearning, that real desire. So Strongly encourage, don't know how to make it happen, but touching into that possibility. Okay, so the third thing that we can misinterpret in our practice is excitement. So we can get excited about wealth and entertainment, um, excited from desire, excited by hatred, excited by judging others, but not able to excite, feel excited about practice and about the benefits of practice. It can be really subtle, especially for most of us householders who, if we're lucky, we get like one good sit a day. And maybe like 40% of that sit, our knee is asleep or achy and kind of, you know, hearing the neighbor's dog. And it might be hard for us to really connect to that excitement of, yes, it's time to practice. This is gonna be awesome. But that joyful enthusiasm, oh, it is so wonderful. And again, we can see it in ourselves for other things, right? What, what do people here get excited about? I know something that Jenny and I share a great excitement about, just getting in the ocean to surf no matter what. And actually, you know, whether it's good or bad, the excitement and enthusiasm is there. I really could use some of my so-called surf stoke on my meditation practice sometimes. Just that like, who cares? We're getting in the water. This is awesome. Very childlike and not childlike as in stupid, right? Or like uninformed, but childlike as in innocent, open. Swimming, says Claudia, yeah. 
Anyone else have something they feel very easily excited about? Could you imagine harnessing that excitement towards your practice? Oh, Laura, that's a tough one. Yeah, if I felt ex as excited about my practice as I do about my cat, I would be like a nonstop practitioner. Yeah, being in my garden, beautiful. Hanging out with my nephew. Ooh, beautiful, a night blooming. I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. Yeah, beautiful, night blooming flower. Dirt roads and my four by four, that sounds fun. <laughs> Good food. So we all know kind of that excitement. <laughs> so can we not like deny these enjoyable other experiences, but try to bring that level of excitement to our practice? Which again, it kind of means like the, the subtle subtext, right? So to have a yearning to wake up, we have to believe we can wake up. To have excitement about our practice, we have to become, you know, real connoisseurs of the quality of practice. So there are these pretty incredible shifts in our mind state that happen when we practice. Absolutely, they can happen after a couple of minutes, but once we practice longer than 18 or 20, there's real shifts neurologically, uh, we can really feel a difference. So a suggestion I would have, which um, we've done in CEB courses before that I've taught is keeping a practice journal. Maybe you just do it for a week and really noticing in a kind of uh, archeologist of your own experience way, like, huh, my mind feels somewhat buoyant and clear and crisp. So noticing the qualities of what happens to your mind with practice, that can really help develop that excitement. You know, I, I know that, you know, being on retreat is a really great way to kind of remind us some ways of these more exceptional, exceptional mind states where we can attain maybe glimpses of waking up or the clear light feeling. So to really give ourselves an opportunity to develop excitement is to Really notice, pay attention, track the benefits of our practice. So after your bell goes off or after your meditation's over, instead of immediately getting up and doing whatever else you need to do, which is so good that you made time, just notice. What's the quality? It's really subtle, like our palate, you know, we have to kind of develop that subtle palate so we notice those experiences. Okay, this next one I think maybe is my, my favorite. And many of you have heard Pema Chodron talk about this uh, a lot. It's a favorite topic of hers, but we can misinterpret and twist our compassion. <laughs> so we can be compassionate uh, to people who, who really endure hardships, um, but actually there, we're feeling compassion for people who are enduring hardships but they are becoming great adepts in their practice. So oh, I feel so bad for those people. They have so little. And yet at a spiritual level, they are really developing more rapidly. Maybe they have less distractions. And this idea is that we need to be compassionate to people, not who just at this kind of visible level appear to be suffering but people who are suffering because they're getting so far away from their own happiness. So as Shanti Deva would put, you know, humans are going about life, destroying the very thing they seek, their own means to happiness. So kind of in our haste, in our fastness, in our running around looking for the next thing, we're trampling upon that which already is right there to make us happy. But we don't 
necessarily feel compassion for those people, right? The, I'm going to judge, so I don't know if it's true, but like the Elon Musks of the world, right? We feel compassion for people who have materially nothing. So don't misinterpret compassion practice in that way. And then the other way that, that Pema talks about a lot is don't misinterpret compassion practice to mean making yourself a doormat for everybody who wants to harm you, right? That's not our compassion. That's not exercising with the wisdom nature of compassion. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's kind of like hilarious to think that we can misinterpret something as beautiful as compassion. <laughs> and, you know, it can actually be an obstacle to our practice. I would say, again, updating a contemporary um, addition to this Lojong slogan that um, a friend and colleague of mine, uh, Brooke Dodson Lavelle, really highlighted years ago. Uh, I remember when she first told me, I was kind of really struck. Um, maybe probably sometime she was doing her dissertation on this work in 2012, possibly, and on how we can really misinterpret self-compassion. Such a beautiful practice to be caring to ourselves, to reduce shame. But if we use self-compassion to just kind of like feel or make everything okay, we might actually not learn from some of our challenges and difficulties. So if I, you know, am really struggling with a difficult relationship or if I'm struggling with a difficult situation and I immediately apply compassion without kind of investigating what is that emotion? What is that trigger? What's happening? Our self-compassion can actually kind of, it can be for the wrong thing. We can use it in a way to just cover up the hurt instead of transforming by understanding. So it's, it's really interesting for us to just be curious about these practices, these, especially these beautiful practices like compassion and self-compassion. And again, kind of soberly and honestly, see how they serve us. So when we look at the steps of self-compassion, yes, Claudia, then I will immediately, I'd love to hear from you is um, the steps of self-compassion, we should really give ourselves enough time to know and notice what is it that hurts? Then apply our compassion. And that is, you know, we recognize whatever it is that hurts us shared by so many and, and that kind turning towards ourselves. Yes, Claudia. I think you kind of answered my question. I guess what, what, what I was wondering is, is like, we need to feel compassion towards difficult people, like you said, who are miserable, who are, you know, away from their own happiness. But, but I guess what I'm thinking about, I'm thinking of a particular person. And I guess what I have tried is to figure out what is it that is, why is it that that person is triggering me? What's mm. it, what is it? What is it about me with respect to that person? And how do I need to change? Is that what you're saying? Like by transforming? Like, what well, is it that I need to? to yeah, 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 yeah. And I think it's more, or, or I mean, change, that would be great. Or transform uh, or whatever. Or, or just learn. Or, okay. Yeah, because I think with certain people, we have these karmic knots and, you know, especially if we're related to them. Um, right like it's just it's a really high high bar to be like I have compassion for you I, I I will make it my life's work to forgive you for harm harmful ways you are in the world that's a great aspiration but I think it's I think we can at least start or I I like to just start with what can I learn from how you know bad I feel in this context and then have compassion for that so it's, you're not with, withholding love and care for yourself, but it's really not applying it so quickly that it's almost like, oh, I hurt. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, I hurt. What hurts? How does it hurt? What is really being kind of 
rubbed here mm -hmm. and then applying the compassion towards so myself not, towards yourself mm -hmm. yeah and especially applying compassion to ourselves to, to people who we find it hard you know like their suffering is hard for us this is what i, I get to do work with healthcare professionals and it's really like 90 percent of what i do it's okay to like give yourself compassion for the pain you witness in others mm. yeah thank you for the question thank you thank yeah you. Okay, so we have patience, yearning, excitement, compassion, two more priorities. <laughs> so we could misinterpret our priorities to be diligent and work hard. Um, but really, it's only to benefit. Um, it's only to benefit kind of ourselves and not to practice Dharma. And there's another one that's interesting interpretation of this, which is that um, our twisted priorities could be um, to actually get our friends and family members excited about these mundane things as well. So we're actually um, we're prioritizing something that's mon you know mundane in the world, meaning not having to do with our spiritual awakening, and then we're also kind of getting other people into it and trying to make them um, like trying to make them excited about these worldly pleasures instead of getting them excited about the Dharma. And that one's, you know, that one I was like struggling with a bit. Um, I don't know about you, but I've never found it useful to try to encourage people to practice meditation, especially not my family members. Um, lead by example, you know, hope that that's enough um but this idea that like our priorities what we think matters that we can kind of lure other people towards it i get that i understand that you know um all of us have to make a living in the world we have to cut wood and carry water and um it can be easy to kind of prioritize that which puts a roof over our head and food on our plates. I struggle with this for sure. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to work and, and earn income and, and do work that matters in the world, but it's not my Dharma. I mean, it's not separate from my Dharma, everything I do, but it's not dedicating, my, dedicating myself to the practice. And we can actually, those of us who do work in the world that we consider like meaningful or, you know, we can kind of delude ourselves even at a level of like oh yeah but you know my work is just like practice but i think i think that can be a slippery slope according to the lojong as we covered last week tush on kush we got to be practicing we got to be really doing that deliberate mind training and it's so funny i mean i maybe this is familiar for you all but the amount of times i have people ask me isn't running like meditation or when I cook or when I'm gardening. And I totally get it. Those are all amazing activities for flow, for a sense of having mind and body in the same place and a continuity. But it's really different than mind training. And thus far, I've seen zero evidence that we can kind of shortcut the mind training. Even in, and I really appreciate this literature and work, even in the psychedelic world, you can kind of use a jackhammer and get to those states, but you're still going to need to use the rake every day to keep them up. And that rake is our everyday practice. So there's not a shortcut for stillness and silence and openness. And I think maybe this one is reminding us like prioritize that it's work. Okay, let's the last one. How can we misinterpret our joy? <laughs> I love this one. Uh, this is talking about celebrating when people that we don't like fail. So schadenfreude, as the German word. So maybe some of us had some of this when the election was called, right? Some of us feel this way. I mean, this time, wow. The last, for sure, four years, the last 18 months of 
just the amount of judgment has been created by the politicization of health um, in this country. It's so intense. Everybody thinks they know better than each other. And that sense of separation and that sense of um, being better than really creates this subverted joy. Because, ooh, are we so happy when that person we believe is wrong is suffering. Such an unwholesome way to be joyful. Such an unwholesome way to be joyful. Even if that person never hears about it, even if we're laughing about someone behind their back, really cultivates an unwholesome mind state. It really... And when we think about the wholesome ways to cultivate our joy, so beautiful, loving kindness, empathetic joy, really rejoicing in the goodness of others, wishing them well. That's a wonderful way to cultivate our joy. It's just tough. We live, I mean, I, I really don't know. I, I, I would love to see a social history. I don't know if there's ever been a time in history when there was so much contempt. Really, really have like perfected ways of judging one another through social media, other outlets. It's, it's really tough to not fall prey to that form of entertainment. It's entertaining. There's no denying that. That's why it's a form of joy, right? Being excited when other people are suffering. Sense of superiority. Yeah. Does that ring true for anybody? <laughs> it's a real tough one. It's a tough one to take a kind of a close look at and and even you know try to commit to like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't be doing that. Any thoughts on that one? That was a really tough one. Can, can you Eve, can you explain the priority one real quick again? Listen to mm. things. Yeah. So in the priorities, it's to act not out of self-interest and to not lead others astray. So the self-interest of kind of like what benefits us in the world. These are like a mundane involvements um, with kind of in making income essentially. And that not only should we not prioritize that, we shouldn't lure others into prioritizing that with us. And instead prioritize our, our practice. Yeah. Um, yes, Laura. In the current environment in which we live, this is a really, really hard one, partially because I think that underneath the schadenfreude, a word I love, uh, is a, a sense of fury and anger that that a lot of things that certain people are doing is 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 putting others at risk. Um, and so it's very hard not to get angry or to wish some kind of comeuppance. In, in, yeah, it's really hard, you know. Yeah, it is really hard. And it is so unsatisfying, the answer I'm going to give you, because it's what I've heard so long. And it really is like, we have to keep going back over and over and over and over and over and over to the common humanity. That even though the way in which certain folks are moving through the world um, creates harm, no denying it, that actually our response should should but our response, if we are working towards our you know, freedom, is one of compassion. We can do that really easily for like a child who's like throwing a tantrum because they wanna go get more ice cream and they are being destructive. Maybe they like in their tantrum kind of like accidentally knock over our favorite bowl. But we wouldn't be like mad at them. We're like, oh, look at the way that they're trying to get their needs met, geez, kind of being a butthead right now, but they're just a kid. And it's so much easier for us, right, to feel that for someone we think is um, uninformed. And, and we don't want to put a superiority on it, like, oh, I feel bad for those people because they just don't know any better and they act that way. 
more that we kind of, as much as we can, work our way towards that inclusive worldview that each and every one of us wants to be happy and avoid pain. That's our common humanity, so simple. Though we go about it in these really stupid and sometimes super harmful ways, just such a challenge, um, such a challenge. Um, and it's just, yeah. And that's when I, I don't, um, oh, we only have one moment. So I'll try to say it quickly. I've been working on a practice recently of um, really highlighting when I, when, I'm, when I am enacting something in a way that's harmful and I realize it. Like I said something that was prideful or dismissive and realize, wow, I could be someone's hard person. <laughs> I mean, like, duh. But to, that is so humbling and helps me with so much empathy. Um, so it's interesting to kind of, when we think about you know those people and the difficult things that they do and harmful ways they do, we, we keep ourselves separate. And so sometimes looking at the ways that we also are, are harmful can be humbling. So think about death and what an asshole you are. That's the story tonight, guys. <laughs> Oh boy. Thank you. So with that, let's <laughs> take <in> our practice. <sighs> I'll take a moment and just reflect on these precious teachings. How incredible that they have made their way to us by the generosity of generations and generations and generations of teachers. May we live up to these aspirations that we can use these practices to be of service and support a world in which all beings know belonging, all beings are healthy, strong, all beings are free. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.